Um, what's interesting is that I was I'm researching for a video on singletons, and um, the singleton pattern is an interesting pattern because it actually has two requirements. Where something like the state pattern, all its only requirement, the only problem that it solves rather is that um, it solves a class that has behavior that changes based on internal state. The singleton pattern solves two problems. One, it solves the problem of being able to access a class globally. And two, it access it solves the problem of forcing or gating a class to only be able to have one instance of itself. And uh, I mean, I, I, when I first read that, I thought maybe I'm just reading, you know, maybe the blog article I was reading is, was incorrect or whatever, but I cross-referenced, you know, I looked at the Gang of Four, I looked at uh, Wikipedia, great source, and uh, all of them, you know, that is what this, that is what the singleton pattern was designed to solve, those two problems. So maybe I'm the only one who didn't know that, but I was like, I was pretty interested in that thought. So yeah, keep an eye out for a video on singletons coming to a YouTube channel near you. <laughs> I've, uh, I've, I've frequently gone on rants about singletons, so I'll try to keep out of this one. It's, it's not <laughs> something I care enough about to do another big rant about it, but... <laughs> And let's just say I, I don't I don't consider them the devil like a lot of people do. I think they have a practical use, more so in game development than other cases. But yeah, you know, I can they are an anti pattern, but sometimes an anti pattern is what you need. Yeah, and it's I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, it definitely is an anti pattern, um, and the use cases are so few and far between that it really is hard to. I mean, even when I was you know I'm I'm still researching for this video, and I have not come up with a, an example yet. Um, because the idea with a singleton pattern is like you need in order for something to be a singleton, it really needs to be at a fundamental level. Um, it needs to be required to, to have only one instance of it, like at the most fundamental level, meaning it, it would absolutely break your, your, your game or application. You know, if there were two instances of that particular class and an example you brought up, I think in our last stream, Jason was the, pl you know, the player, some, that's a common one. You know, people think I'll make the player singleton because obviously I'm writing a single player game. I'll never have a need for another player class. Um, and just because you don't have a need for it doesn't mean that it would fundamentally break your game if you had two of them. Um, and then, you know, you kind of mentioned that, you know, some games, I forgot, I think maybe it was Half-Life 2. Some games actually will cheat a little bit. Game game dev has a lot of cheating. So maybe you'll new up an, another player in in, the, in a in a scene transition or something, you'll have two for like a fraction of a second so they can pass data between each other or, you know, maybe for a cut scene, you generate a new player. It happens to have a player class on it. You know, there, there are cases where for simplicity of design, every scene could have a player and you load in and just instantiate the player. If there's no state on them, there's no reason to have to literally try to make it a, um, you know, uh, don't destroy unload object or something. You're just asking for trouble. In some cases, it's just easier. Exactly, which is why in this video, <laughs> I'm trying to come up with an example. And e even an audio system isn't really a great example because, you like, again, like you said in the last stream, you may have, uh, you know, two implementations of audio. Um, you know, maybe you have an edge case where some audio files need to play, you know, you need to play a certain type of audio file. So then you're like, all right, I'll new up uh, a new implementation of the audio system class that, you know, handles this particular case. So, yeah, what I was working on, what I was attempting to to justify for uh, a, mo um, a singleton was I was creating like a point and click game, like think of, I don't know, Mist or Riven, if you're familiar with those. I was thinking, well, maybe like some sort of there's like some sort of global nav navigator that handles, you know, point and click movement. And then I just thinking, like, is there, you know, would it fundamentally break the game if I had two of those in existence? Um, maybe that would be a good case for Singleton, but I'm not I'm not convinced yet. So I'm still trying to come up with well, an example for that video. Here's here's a dangerous example that um, might uh, scare off some of the more diehard um, design pattern fans, but. Um, I'm a pragmatist, so despite a lot of the, the banging the drum for, pra for practical, you know, high architecture designs, um, an honest truth is a lot of the systems that I'll work on, um, I will use dependency inversion, and I'll extract out a dependency I have, so say for example, a scoreboard, and for the sake of the first 
three months of development, I need my scoreboard to be a thing that receives scores and can be queried to get score data out. There's zero reason that I couldn't just make a singleton scoreboard manager and defer uh, wrap it in a, in a scoreboard adapter and pass that into all of the scripts that need it. And I have a single point of entry to deal with all of my scoreboard stuff. Is that scalable in the long term? Not really, but it will work for the good development time where I've managed to extract out a dependency so my code doesn't rely on it. So I've kept open close principle for all of the dependent libraries. Right. But the actual object itself, I can kind of cheat and make it a singleton because I know when the time comes to remove the singleton and replace it with a more robust system, I only have to do a new thing, which has the adapter of uh, the scoreboard, and I can swap it out correctly using some sort of DI solution. So I'll often use a singleton as a stopgap or an intermediary to say, mm -hmm. at some point, something will go here that will be more robust and manage the solution. But right now, you know, all input can be provided from input dot get button down and I'll just use a unity input provider dot instance and pass it into everything until I care enough to make a cross platform solution of some kind. Yeah, that's that, I think that's a great approach. It's you know it's definitely more sophisticated. And um I mean it's a good it's a good like compromise um uh, because it really helps you move on while it, it allows you to be agile because that's, you know, basically whenever someone uses a singleton, they're just trying to, it's basically a shortcut, you know? Um, and so it, it allows you to take advantage of that shortcut, but not tie your code to, you know, to that, to that shortcut, to that singleton. So, yeah, yeah, so I hope that doesn't ruin my, uh, my cred as someone who's supposed to bang the drum about all the high architecture stuff. But realistically, <laughs> there's sometimes you just need to, I don't want to call it cut corners, but you have to be a pragmatist. You have to put in stuff that you need to make things work. And then providing you draw your lines correctly, that's, that's the kind of thing I care about. I don't care about using the correct pattern all the time. It's very hard to build something the first time correctly. But you can put the right breaks and the right lines in place to say, when the time comes to do this correctly, it'll have the least amount of ripple effects for the rest of my code. There's a lot of bad practices that I will do intermediary to get the point across. So I often skeleton out a lot of the system by putting in debug prints whenever stuff should happen or singletons here or there or fire off events that are listened to just by the console. And all of these things are not the real implementation, but they work. And I can prove an end-to-end -end test and um, replace it with good architecture when time comes. So for me, architecture is more about drawing the correct boundary lines than it is getting the exact right multi-chain factory thing the first time, you know? Yeah, for sure. I, I think that's a key uh, key takeaway, the, drawing those boundaries. Um, you know, the guy who created uh, Agile, I think it's Jeff Sutherland. Um, I'll have to look it up. But he uh, I, he did a video. He was, had a video on YouTube and I was watching it. And he was saying that, you know, when in being Agile, if you're stuck between two decisions, uh, you should choose the one that's the easiest to change later. Um, and I think that's important because, you know, when you do something like you leverage a singleton, you really lock yourself in and make it very hard to change and backpedal. Whereas, you know, in the way that Jason described, where you uh, just you set it up in a way that you can replace it with something else later on by just having it be a private member variable or something that you inject on a constructor or something, um, you're you're giving yourself the ability to change and back out. And you're still using a singleton in this case because you're just calling that instance in the constructor or whatever, whatever, whatever it might be. But, um, but at least you're opening your code to change in the future, you know, getting yourself stuck. A finer point I'm sure we've covered before. Uh, singleton doesn't mean private static instance, whatever. Singleton means that there is one of it by the rules of your system. So yep. uh, as your application scales, you may potentially use a DI framework. And if you do, singleton could just mean using it as a singleton instance, which basically means you add a scope of the singleton to it. Um, so you don't have to worry too much because if, even in DI frameworks, you're using singletons without really thinking about it. So I, it, I don't know. I just it's not, it's not a monstrous solution. It's something that is very practical for what you need. So later on, you can scale it back, remove the singleton-ness from it, and then just inject it as a singleton when and where you need it. Well, yeah, and that's something like, you know, when you think of the state, uh, the state pattern video I just did, and, you know, some of the comments about how the implementation, um, 
you know, how I did the implementation. At the end of the day, I follow, that implementation follows the rules of the state pattern. So if you don't like the implementation, you have a problem with the implementation, not the pattern. I did follow the rules of the pattern. So that's the thing about design patterns. It's just a description of how to solve a problem, uh, not necessarily an implementation. And, and, and that's the same thing, with, like you said, with singletons. You really can uh, implement a singleton in a lot of different ways. Same with the state pattern. And really any, most, most patterns I would say have more, obviously more than one uh, implementation. But the and idea honest, is you follow the rules. Yeah, and, and the thing that people get wrong is a lot of the reason why people say singletons are bad are not because of the singleton. It's because they use it incorrectly. So an example of what is bad, regardless of what solution you pick, is to concretely describe your um, instantiation of your object inside of a script. So for example, using a singleton is not bad if you inject a singleton via a constructor. Writing singleton dot blank inside of a script is bad because now you have broken the open close principle and we'll have to open that script to remove it. But if it was a singleton in principle, but injected as an instance or as a collaborator, you actually don't have that problem. So when people say something is good or bad, ask yourself what the reasoning behind that might have been and why, um, how you might mitigate some of the issues from it. So singletons tend not to be bad as a logical principle. They're bad because they're traditionally implemented as a concretely described something dot instance dot in the middle of a function mm -hmm. that is tightly coupling two scripts that don't need to know about each other. That is usually why it's bad, not the actual singleton itself. And I think it's hard to convey to some some developers, especially younger developers, why that's bad because you don't really feel the pain of that until much further down the line in your project. You know, when when the when the features change or some new mechanic is required, some requirement comes through that you didn't, you know, you, you didn't predict because for human, obviously we wouldn't have predicted it. And then you come through and you realize, well, I have to make a change to this class and, you know, it's tightly coupled to this method. So then the question is, do I add it to the singleton? It doesn't really make any sense, but if, if I'm going to change it out, now I got to go and find every place where I'm referencing this, I am hard referencing the singleton, and, and then you got to swap it out manually. And that's a huge pain in the butt that you don't ever really get to if you don't work on a single project consistently and, and see it actually grow with, uh, with features.